Imagine the following scenario. Imagine we have two microservices and as you might expect, our microservices live as containers in a containerized environment. What does it mean? It means that service A and service B are literally running in Docker containers, which are machines in their own. So meaning service A is going to have its own IP address, probably a different port as well. And service B is also going to have its own unique IP address. So these are totally different machines. So this one is going to be, for example, let's say 10.1. As you can see, the IPs are different. Now, whenever a service A, or let's even call it a client for simplicity, this is a client and this is service B. Whenever a client wants to make a request to a different service like this, it, it's easy to do that because we know the IP of the other service and we can literally hard code it in our code and make a request to this. But now imagine our application is becoming more popular, meaning service B is now going to get more requests from the client. And now since we want to be able to handle those, we realize that, wow, now we need to scale our service B. Scaling meaning uh, spinning up more instances of service B. So let's spin up this one and let's spin up this one. This is literally called auto scaling. So depending on how much load your instance gets, it's going to spin up new instances and remove them as the loads get low, lower. But here's the thing, the new instances are going to have completely different IP addresses. So this one's gonna have three, this one's maybe gonna have five. They don't have to be in sequence. And maybe two minutes later, service B or the middle one literally goes away because there's some kind of an error and it's trying to restart. And even after it's restarted, most likely it's going to be assigned a completely different IP address. Now the question is, how on earth can client know the new IP addresses of these newly spun up instances? There's literally no way. That's why in microservices, there's a concept call, called service discovery. What is a service discovery? Well, I'm literally going to copy paste this and put it here because it's, it's literally a machine or service, service discovery or registry, service registry, and let's make it yellow for, so that it's easier to understand. This is going to be our database with all the names of the services and their corresponding IP addresses. So what is going to happen is every service that we have here is going to register itself in the service registry. This one and this one and this one. And now, as you can imagine, we have one guy here, one service registry, which is aware of all these instances. And let's say if service B goes away, it dies. Now, its service registry is going to know that, okay, there's probably no service B anymore but we still have others. And now whenever a client wants to make a request to one of these servers, services, it's going to first contact the service registry, get the IP address, and then make a request to the service. Okay, as simple as that. And this is called a client-side service discovery. Now, before we go to the backend side service discovery, because this is also a different beast, I wanna quickly give a shout out to the sponsor of this video, Eraser. Eraser is literally the dashboard that you're seeing here. And I'm loving literally every second that I'm working with it. And I would highly recommend trying it out as well for your own projects, whenever you want to explain something to your colleagues, maybe, or maybe if you're simply trying to make a sketch for your next application, try it out. You can literally add code blocks, different kind of icons from Azure, Amazon, AWS, really a lot of icons. And of course, you can also try AI diagrams, literally typing text and getting a diagram out. And now back to server side search discovery. What is it going to look like? Let me delete these arrows. So service side discovery is going to look like the following. So our client no longer does the job itself. It doesn't contact the service registry directly. Why? Because imagine we have two different clients, or maybe we have 10 different clients. So as you can expect, usually these in microservices, you're free to choose your programming language. What happens is if this client is written in Node.js and this one is in Rust, they're going to have to implement their own logic for retrieving 
the IP addresses from the service registry. And this is going to be a lot of not boilerplate code, but a lot of different code. And you have to deal with different languages. A simpler way, turns out, is actually having a middleman kind of. So let's create this middleman here. And this middleman usually will be your elastic load balancer. All right, if we're talking in the AWS world. So let's simply call it a load balancer or it can also be some kind of a different service that is also able to balance the load somehow. What's going to happen is the client is going to contact this load balancer. The load balancer is going to contact the service registry so that it already knows which IPs it, gonna, it can contact. It's going to get the IPs back and then it's going to do load balancing as well as rerouting the client's request. Now, as you can see, here's like a more trips. So one trip here and another, another trip here. So you might add a couple milliseconds to your request, but at least it's kind of an abstraction, meaning every client written in any language can make a request to this load balancer. And actually, let me show you some examples. So if you're developing in Node.js, you can literally do client side Service discovery with an npm package called cold console. Actually, it's also like a service that it's probably available in different programming languages as well. But for Node.js, this is the most popular one, and it's really easy. It's literally like you create a simple Node server and do some add some settings, and it's ready to go. If you're a Spring developer, you have Netflix Eureka service discovery. You can also use Apache Zookeeper. It's more complicated, but it's more powerful, and if we are again talking about AWS, AWS EC2 instances are able to automatically do that because whenever you're spinning an EC2 instance, you can at the same time register, uh, sorry, whenever you're spinning the load balancer, an elastic load balancer, you can attach instances to it so that it already knows which instances it can load it to. So, which means a service registry in the AWS world kind of already lives inside the load balance, uh, elastic load balancer. All right. If you found this video useful, but you want to know what the advanced method looks like, because nowadays, if you're using Kubernetes, Kubernetes has a built in um, a proxy, which can also act as a service registry for your pods. All right. So you don't have to deal with anything here. You don't have to use have a console service or uh, use um, a Eureka search discovery, all right? Kubernetes is going to do that. And I'm going to explain this concept in my new video, which is probably going to come out next week. So make sure to subscribe. And if you like this video, of course, give it a like, and I will see you in the next. Goodbye.